I hope that has been not just your song this morning, but your prayer throughout the series. Praising God and being able to praise God no matter what season of life that you are in. As we seek to live a life without lack, to seek a life that is uh, following after God, trusting in God, obeying God no matter where he would lead us, trusting him in the good times as well as the dark valleys that we go through in life. And so as we end our series on living a life without lack this morning, I just want to once again direct our thoughts and turn to Psalm 23 as we read uh, this passage this morning. So if you have your Bibles or if it's up on the screen as well, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How many of you like a party? How many of you like a feast? What sort of things would you want at your feast? If you were to, like, to name anything, what sort of things would you want? Good food? All right. What kind of food do you want? Hog roast? Anybody else? Fry? Prime rib. Chip, I feel sorry for you. She's got expensive tastes. What else would you want at your party? Ice cream? Turkey? Do, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Homemade pie. Oh, pie. Mm. Some good Essen House pie, even. I would take that. That's good. Like, when I think of a feast, I always think of Thanksgiving. Um, you have turkey, you have yams, all of the fixing, rolls and butter. And my favorite, my personal favorite, stuffing. Big stuffing fan, as you can tell. I love a good feast. And you just sort of eat and eat and eat at Thanksgiving. And then we all sort of sit around and we watch the Detroit Lions lose. That's sort of how Thanksgiving works um, at, at our house, at our gatherings. But, like, there is a lot of preparation that goes into these feasts as well, right? Like, these feasts don't just magically, like, pop up. There's work that goes into them. There's work that has to come before we enjoy them. And so with all of the food, we have to uh, fix it. We have to go buy it first, right? fix it and try to make sure everything as much as possible all comes out at the right time so nothing's dry or not quite done yet. There's preparation that goes into that, preparing the meal. If you're having friends over, if you're having a party at your house, there are preparations that go into preparing the house, right? You got to sweep and dust and make sure all of the dishes are done, all of the things that you've sort of put off throughout the week on it and you're like, oh, nobody's going to see this. Like, now everybody's going to see it. And so you have to kind of hide it a little bit, put it away. There are preparations that have to be made, right? Or if you have kids like me, there are preparations just to get the kids up, let alone ready to go, ready for the feast, ready for what is to come. Before we can enjoy the feast, before we can enjoy the party, Before you can enjoy the festivities, there are preparations that always have to be made first. In this Psalm 23, there are preparations as well that the shepherd has been making. All of these things don't happen by accident. They don't magically appear that the sheep is all of a sudden beside quiet waters. All of a sudden has a a place to lay down. All of a sudden is able to make it through a dark valley. No, it is the shepherd who has made preparations first. And so in, in that culture, the shepherd was in charge of not just preparing a place, a table, but preparing the sheep as well. Now when we think of a, a table, we think of a feast, don't we? Now, how does this translate into sheep? How does this translate into shepherding? The the sheep don't want 
a lamb roast, right? They don't want a hog roast. It's not going to do them any good, right? So what is the shepherd preparing them? Not a table as we would think of a table to put food on, but rather a table land, a, a, a flat area where they can go and, and be at pasture in peace. You see, the shepherd goes to prepare this table land, this grazing area for the sheep. And it, again, he doesn't just magically like stumble upon it. No, he, he has to search it out. And once he's found it, then he's able to take materials uh, there to prepare sort of a camp for when he will take the sheep there. And he brings minerals to, to put into the, the field. And, and why? Because the sheep need nutrients. And so he prepares it by spreading minerals. He prepares it by uh, cleaning out the water hole from all of the, the sticks and the twigs and the algae that might be there. And, and so after a long winter, he clears it out. Why? So that the sheep have a clean place to get water. He goes around and he digs out all of the poisonous plants. He drives away any snakes that might be around, drives away predators. He kind of looks throughout, okay, I see this is going to be a problem area and I have to watch out for predators. This is a potential blind spot that I need to be aware of. And so he sort of scouts the land. He prepares the land for the day that he will take the sheep to this place. But he doesn't just prepare a place, he prepares the sheep as well. In that day, whenever you get a lot of different animals, and they all kind of nuzzle against each other for warmth, and so diseases and stuff pass very quickly. And one of the diseases in that day was something called mange. And it would get on them, and, and what would happen is there, it would be irritating to their skin and to their fur, and their fur would fall out. So it was a skin disease, and, and the shepherd definitely doesn't want them to have that and doesn't want this to spread, so he has to prepare them. Another thing that would happen with the sheep, and as the sheep were there at this elevation, there would these, be these things called nose flies. And this is going to be kind of disgusting, and it will definitely be even more painful for the sheep because what happened is these flies would come lay eggs in the, the soft tissue of their nose, and when these things would hatch, they would go deeper in and sort of burrow in. And so this, it wouldn't kill the sheep, but it would be incredibly painful for them. So the shepherd must prepare the sheep. And what they would do is there is this special mixture of oil that they would spread on the sheep. Paying special attention to their head. Because that's when they're nuzzling together. They're nuzzling heads together. And that's where the, the flies would go. And so they, they would spread this oil, this oil mixture on them to protect the sheep. And, and this wouldn't be the sweetest smelling oil. I know some of you have like essential oils that smell really good. This is not that. This is not 10,000 rose blooms all concentrated together. This would, be, this would smell like sulfur. Have you ever smelled sulfur? Have you ever had that, that smell of rotten egg? Can you smell it? Can you imagine being just dosed in this? And, and as a sheep, you're like, oh, am I sure the nose flies aren't, are worse than this? It's like the, 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 the choice I make. Are the mosquitoes worse than the smell of the bug spray? For them, it definitely was worth it to be oiled, to be anointed with this oil to be prepared for the place that the shepherd had prepared for them. The shepherd prepares a place and his sheep for a place of grazier, grazing and abundance and blessing. Now, throughout this psalm, David has said what? The Lord is my shepherd. And keeping with this... The, when we get to this part that he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies, uh, David's not saying, you know, he literally goes to the enemy camp and sets up a table. You know, he goes to work where our enemies are. He goes to uh, the, the middle of ISIS where our enemies are, and he just sets up a table. That's not what he's talking about here. 
See, God prepares his people for a place of peace. God prepares a place. Now, I think when, it, when we first hear that, God prepares a place, we think of Jesus, right? I'm going to prepare a place for you. He's talking about heaven, and he'll come back and take us to be with him. I don't think that's what David's talking about here. Why? Because David says it's in the midst of our enemies. You see, I think this is not like some future place where we have complete and total rest. He's not saying that God prepares a place way up in the mountains where we as Christians can go and find, you know, escape from the world. No, he's saying that, that God is preparing a place for us in the midst of our enemies. He's preparing a place for us in the midst of all of the things that might attack us. God's preparing a place, but it's not a place in, in, in terms of geography. I think what David is trying to get at here is a state of being. A state of peace. God prepares a place of peace for believers, for those who follow their good shepherd. But no matter what might happen in life, no matter the, the bad things that might happen, no matter how difficult life can be at times, God is preparing us. We see this with Paul in Philippians he says this, I am not saying this because I am in need. So Paul has been through all sorts of need. He's been through all sorts of trials. He says, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I have learned to be at peace whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through Christ, through him who gives me strength. See, God had already been at work in Paul's life preparing his heart and preparing his mind. Bringing him to the state of peace where he's able to say, listen, I am content in all circumstances. No matter what life throws at me, no matter how many people come after me, I am at peace. God had prepared a table, had prepared a place of peace that Paul was able to live into and that we are able to live into as well. Now, how does God prepare us? Because I don't know about you, I've never been like smothered by God in oil, right? I've never been like ha anointed in that way. Never had oil all over my body and, and, and for the purpose of like God saying, now you are anointed. I have anointed you, my sheep, my son. So the question is like, how does God anoint us? It's interesting, throughout scripture, oil represented the presence of Christ. That's why we anoint people with oil who may be going through sickness or whatever. It, it's not that the oil brings healing, but rather it, it's to denote the presence of Christ with them. And I think it's the same thing here. God anoints us with his presence and changes us. Because it's nothing that we can do ourselves. Did, did Paul say that I am able to do this on my own? No. He says, I'm able to do this because it is him and his strength that has done this in me. It is God who is oiling us with his presence. And so we draw near to God and, and God's presence anoints us more and more so that we are able to say we are in a place of peace. This isn't something that happens overnight. It's not like I've, I've accepted Christ and all of a sudden like it's complete bliss though. It happens over time. Paul talks in Romans sort of about the Christian journey, about what it means to be in Christ. He says this, therefore, since we have been justified through faith. Justified is a, is a fancy word for declared, uh, declared clean, declared not guilty of our sins. We've been declared not guilty of all of the things that we have done in life because of Jesus, through our faith in Jesus. God declares us not guilty. We are justified. Okay? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So first off, God prepares us 
by making peace with him. He anoints us, forgives us of our sin. We have been justified through faith. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. We glory in our sufferings. We find a place of peace even in the midst of our sufferings. Because we know that our suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. When we keep hope in mind, it should bring peace to our hearts. Next week, we will celebrate Jesus Christ conquering death itself. And, and we know that in Christ, we too will share in that resurrection. That we too will be raised to new life. We have this assurance, this hope. And I hope in your own life that has brought you peace. That as God has poured more and more of himself into you, he has revealed to you more and more of what it means to live in this place of peace. But sometimes getting there is a journey. So many times in my own life, have you ever just felt that overwhelming sense of, huh, like, it's this peace that just comes upon you. And I, I felt that a lot in my life. But over the last couple of months, God has also been revealing some areas of my own life that aren't experiencing that peace. Aren't experiencing the peace that I should be experiencing and, and hoping. And instead, what will happen is I get frustrated. I'll want things my own way. I'll push against something. And over the last couple of months, as I've allowed God to open up my heart, he's anointed me with his presence. He's begun to change me in a lot of ways. God anoints us with more and more of his presence. Get us to a place of peace where we can say, no matter what difficulty, I am at peace. No matter what God would call me to do, I am at peace. No matter what dark valley I may be going through, I am in a place of peace. People of God, I, I invite you to continue to seek more of God's anointing presence in your life. To know that it is God who is at work changing you, molding you into the image of Christ. Molding you and anointing you with his presence to prepare you for this state of peace that you can get to. That you can say, no matter what happens, it is well with my soul. No matter well fed or, or hungry, I am at peace. No matter through dealing with hardships or, or experiencing blessing, I am at peace. And I can do this because God himself has anointed me with his presence. He has given me the strength to do this. I hope that is where you are at this morning. So this morning, I just want to invite you to more. Invite you to more of God's presence. To not just celebrate what God has done for you, because he's done a lot, but also to say, God, reveal more of yourself to me. Because, God, I, I think there are some areas in my life where I'm not experiencing your peace. God, prepare me your sheep, for the place of peace that you want to take me to. As the worship team comes forward,
I invite you this morning to not just celebrate what God has done, but also to want more. The prayer team will be up here during the song and following the service, and and maybe you would simply say your prayer this morning is, God, I, I worship you for what you've done, but I want more as well. And we invite you forward. The prayer team will pray over you to sort of anoint you with their prayers. But may the cry of your heart this morning be, God, anoint me with more of your presence. Prepare my heart for your peace.